Presidential candidate Beto O'Rourke made his name as a national Democrat in Texas last year when he nearly unseated Republican Senator Ted Cruz, lost by three percentage points. The two opponents appeared on 60 Minutes just days before that election. At the time, O'Rourke insisted he would not run for president in 2020, no matter what he said. We asked him about changing his mind and how he's already been mocked by the president. President Trump has already weighed in on your candidacy. He said this about you. He's got a lot of hand movement. Is he crazy or is that just the way he acts? You do have a lot of hand movement. <laughs> I'm not saying that's good or bad, but yeah, there are a lot of hand yeah, movements. Yeah, I'm, I'm, pretty <laughs> I'm pretty animated. Uh, I call that passion. I, I, I remember <laughs> when we were campaigning in Texas, someone pulled me aside and he said, hey, I just want to give you some, some free advice. You move around too much when, when you talk. Yeah. Um, I am who I am. Yes. Um, and, and I really do think that we all want to get past the pettiness, um, the personal attacks. Uh, we've got some real big challenges in front of us and some extraordinary opportunities. Let's make the most of them and let's do that together. Let's not put anybody down. Instead, let's lift each other up. I've heard Beto O'Rourke described as a star and Beto O'Rourke described as a loser in the same sentence. Star because look what he did in Texas with that race. You came within three percentage points in a deep red state. Loser because at the end of the day he lost the race. What do you say to that? He couldn't win in his own state. How can he win the country? Yeah, I lost that race. But in the process of running that campaign, we were able to help change the, the face of democracy in Texas. So many young people who understand that their voice and their vote will make a difference in their future. So many candidates who are running along with us who, who won their elections and might not otherwise have been able to do so. In some way, we were part of some much larger victory uh, for our state and for our country. And now Texas counts. So where's the loser part of that sentence? <laughs> well, I, I, I lost the race. Um, and, yeah. and I'll tell you, at the end of the day, squarely, that is, is on me. And it's, it's a recognition that you can always do uh, a better job. There's always the ability to learn from your mistakes. But in so doing, I don't want to lose sight of the fact that we got to be part of uh, a tremendous movement and community whose power still persists long after that election. In this particular, with the Democratic candidates, there are more women and more people of color than ever before. Some could say it's the way the party is leaning, that maybe the voters are signaling that's the candidate we want. Yeah. Do you feel at a disadvantage as a white man? As a privileged white man, they say about you. I, I don't feel at a disadvantage, and at the same time, I feel extraordinarily grateful that the Democratic Party has produced so many extraordinary candidates, each of whom brings a different set of skills and life experiences and background. This is a great moment for America. It's a great moment for the Democratic Party, and I count myself so lucky to be a part of it. I really want to see, Beto, why you feel so strongly that you are the one. When you really sat down in your heart of hearts and said, you know, I want this job. Yeah. I'll tell you, this is very much um, a personal decision, one that I made with my family, with my wife, Amy. And when we think about what's going on in this country, and when we think about our kids and their future, we really do then look back at ourselves and our responsibility to do everything we can. But I'm curious about your family decision. Because after the 60 Minutes interview, I know everybody has a right to change their mind. You were so adamant about, I'm not going to do it. Yeah. The family would not survive. Yeah. And Henry, your youngest, said, I would cry every day if you run for the presidency. So what changed for you and the family? After the campaign that we ran for Texas and after election night, um, the best decision was made by my wife, Amy, where she said, um, there are lots of people who are talking about us doing lots of different things. Let's, instead of trying to figure that out right now, just spend some time as a family. That's really what we did. I was able, we were able to see just how resilient and strong our kids were. And as Amy and I came closer to making this decision, we didn't have a sit down conversation with our kids. They just voluntarily started offering advice. Hey dad, if you run, um, this is how I think you should do it. Or, hey dad, you've got to run because of this or that issue. Th these were the conversations on the ride home from school or to on basketball practice. On their own, we would encourage you? On their Unsolicited, own. Unsolicited, really? Unsolicited, and I, I honestly did not expect that. But I think they're just as sensitive to what's going on in the world right now. Mm -hmm. They understand that they will inherit the consequences of the choices that you and I make at this moment, and they're counting on us to make the right ones.
So he's got three kids, Ulysses, who's 12, Molly, who's 10, Henry, who's eight. So they're still little guys, and they all know the toll it's going to take. But he, of course, he has a family support 150%. But it was interesting, everywhere he goes, people go, how do you say your name? Is it Beto? Is it Beto? And somebody in his campaign says, it's Beto, like you can bet on him. And I wow. thought, that's a good way to remember it, yeah. for those of you who are trying to figure out, how do you say this guy's name? But mm -hmm. he's a fascinating person, and a lot of people are getting to know him for the first time. Yeah. But it's now 599 days till election, so you've got a lot right. of time.